Good morning, everyone. As you can see, I'm not Governor Scott, but he'll be joining us shortly. He is currently on a call with fellow governors and White House officials discussing vaccine distribution. And when he is done, he will join us for the question and answer portion. Today, I'll start by giving an update on Vermont's vaccine rollout. Commissioner Pichek will present our weekly modeling and Dr. Levine will provide a health update. As of this morning, over 55,000 Vermonters have received vaccines, 35,500 vaccines. Uh, Vermonters received their first dose and 19,500 Vermonters received their second dose. That means nearly 10% of eligible Vermonters who can receive the vaccine have been administered at least their first dose. We have now registered 34,170 Vermonters as of this morning, 75 years and older, who are scheduled for their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine over the next five weeks. So far, more than 14% of Vermonters, 75 and older, have received their first dose. That's up from 6% last week. The health department COVID-19 vaccination clinics uh, are proceeding as scheduled today. Uh, if you have an appointment to receive the vaccine today and you are concerned, you can monitor the, the weather. But as you can see out there, the weather has turned in a little bit in our favor and we haven't been getting the snow, at least in the central to the northern parts of Vermont that have been anticipated. So those who want to change their appointments because there are snow, you can call 855-722-7878 to reschedule. You'll be given a new appointment for the same time on a day later this week, or you can ask for a new appointment on a different day. We have not had many cancellations. Um, as of this morning, I heard that we had about 21 cancellations. So people are looking at the weather and making the decisions based upon what they're seeing outside their window. Um, let me just uh, move on a little bit, turning to additional locations because I wanna keep you updated on additional locations. Currently, there are 87 available appointments in Windsor County although they may not be on your preferred date and time. We're looking at adding appointments at Mount Escutney Hospital coming available next week, and perhaps additional allocations of vaccine to Springfield Hospital soon. We've added a clinic in Alberg to serve that area and the upper portion of Grand Isle County. In early February, we are planning to add capacity with available point appointments at Grace Cottage Hospital in Wyndham County, and later in the month in, uh, with Copley Hospital, Hospital in Lamoille County, Northwest Medical Center in Franklin County, North Country Hospital in, uh, in uh, Newport, and Gifford Medical Center in Orange County. Uh, on the issue of homebound, we have been waiting for CDC guidance on transporting vaccines. Uh, for those that are homebound, as I have mentioned, we plan to use home health and the EMS providers to del deliver vaccines uh, to those individuals. We've developed several different math methods from going to the home with the vaccine to arranging mobile clinics, depending on recommended, recommended guidance from the CDC. Last night, we received preliminary, preliminary guidance so that by the end of this week, it is our hope to start delivering vaccine to homebound Vermonters. We have also established a working group to look at the best time to begin the process of opening up long-term care facilities to congregate dining and other activities once a sufficient time period has elapsed to fully allow the vaccine to build up the body's immunity to the virus in the residents of these facilities. Our, senior, our seniors living in long-term care facilities have been isolated for far too long, and it is our hope to reestablish those social connections as soon as possible. All 37 skilled nursing facilities 
have received their first and second dose of the vaccine uh, according to schedules, as well as 87% of residential care facilities and 94% of assisted living facilities have received at least their first dose with many receiving their second dose. In all, a total of 85% of long-term care residents, that includes skilled nursing facilities, residential care, and assisted living, have elected to receive their first dose of vaccine. This successful, I can't say this enough, and I'll repeat it again, this successful statewide vaccination effort um, has many people to thank. Uh, it has the state employees across multiple departments and agencies uh, who have worked hard to put this program together, our health partners who have partnered with us to provide vac vaccination sites, loved ones, neighbors, and friends who have lent a helping hand, not only to sign people up, but to transport them to the vaccination sites. Um, it's, it's been because of all these people um, that this has been a success. It's been no one person, no one department, no one agency, no one individual. Um, it's been a concerted effort of all Vermonters to, uh, to make this happen. And again, I say thank you. Lastly, for those who have not signed up for your uh, vaccine, I would urge those Vermonters 75 years and older who have not yet done so to register for the vaccine. Please do so by going online at the Health Department's website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. That's healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or simply call our registration call center at 855-722-7878. I'll now turn this presentation over to Commissioner Pichek, who will give you his weekly update on trends. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Smith, and uh, good morning, everyone. This past week uh, has brought continued good news and further reasons for optimism as favorable trends across the country persist. With cases, hospitalizations, and even deaths continuing to decrease as we climb down from our most recent peak. While we certainly appreciate this good news, we must remember, however, that cases and hospitalizations remain very high across our country, and January was the deadliest month of the pandemic to date. Closer to home, we also have reason for optimism and reason for caution. Our region continues to see significant improvement, and in Vermont, our statewide cases remain stable and have continued their gradual downward trend. However, that experience has not been universal, as trends in Bennington County have not improved and, in fact, over the past week have worsened. Over the last three weeks, national seven-day case rates have trended down and have continued to do so at a very rapid pace, representing a more than 40% decrease over this period of time. And we're still continuing to see widespread improvement with every single region of the country seeing their cases and their hospitalizations trending down. The CDC's most recent forecast, which is a combined forecast of all the best modelers across the country, anticipates that cases will continue to go down over the next three weeks as well. While the improvement in cases is certainly very good news, we again must be mindful that we are continuing to report an additional one million new cases across the country in less than one week's time. Looking at our regional data, we see that we are seeing some significant improvements as well, with close to 30,000 fewer cases reported this week compared to last. For the first time in over five weeks, New York reported fewer than 10,000 cases in a single day. And for the first time in over 10 weeks, Quebec reported under 1,000 cases in a single day. And this is the third straight week in which cases have seen decline in the region, and it's the far fewest, the, it's the fewest number of weekly cases that we've seen in the region since November 23rd. However, as you can see from this chart, the case counts continue to be elevated and the risk in the region remains high. With the improved cases and over 2.7 million tests performed across the region this past week, 
It has driven our regional positivity rate below the 5% recommended by the World Health Organization, the first time it's been under 5% uh, in over three months. Again, continued positive trends and good news. Vermont's case trends also continue to move in the right direction, with us reporting 82 fewer cases this week compared to last, and our seven-day case rate continuing to gradually fall, down 29% 29, 29 from its most recent high. We're also seeing improvement in the number of active cases in Vermont, with the number uh, trending down for the past three weeks. But again, just like with regional cases, we must remember that there are still a significant number of active cases in our state, far more than we experienced during the spring, and far more pretty much than any other time during the recent surge. So Vermonters must remain vigilant. Not only are our overall cases on the decline, but so too are our cases among our highest risk populations. Again, we're paying very close attention to cases that occur in the 65 and older population, since this is our most vulnerable group in terms of severe illness and death. Over the past two weeks, the number of high risk cases has decreased both in the aggregate and as a percentage of our overall cases, meaning we are less likely to see severe outcomes compared to where we stood just four weeks ago. As we mentioned last week, we have also been seeing fewer cases in our long-term care facilities. And as you can see from the outbreak chart, we have far fewer current outbreaks as well. As we've said many times, protecting this most vulnerable group of Vermonters remains a key of our strategy. Again, with fewer cases among this high-risk population, we're seeing fewer deaths in our state as well. We saw the number of fatalities drop by 60% compared to December. And as we vaccinate more and more of the vulnerable population over the weeks and the months ahead, we anticipate seeing fewer and fewer of these high-risk cases, and as a result, less severe illness and fewer deaths. Turning to Bennington County for a moment, this county continues to stand out compared to the rest of the state for three reasons. First, it has a disproportionately high uh, percentage of active cases. It has sustained growth in these cases that dates back to early December, and recently it's seen an increase in its hospitalizations. Regarding the hospitalizations, with the overall number of hospitalizations continuing to increase in the state, we can see that this is now being driven in part by Bennington County. Hospitalizations across the rest of the state have been trending down since the middle of January, as our case trends have been slowly trending down over that same period of time as well. But in Bennington, they have been trending up along with their increased case counts. Again, looking at the regional heat map, we continue to see that Bennington is likely influenced by the counties to its west, which have a much higher caseload than the counties around the other parts of Vermont's east and southern borders. And we must remember also that Bennington is an older county, meaning its population is more at risk of having significant health outcomes if they contract the virus. So again, while it's important for all Vermonters to remain vigilant, certainly this is particularly true for those currently uh, in Bennington County. Turning to a minute to the college restart, we again wanted to illustrate the more challenging environment our colleges are facing in the spring semester compared to the fall. These two regional heat maps show the relative differences between the start of the fall semester compared to the spring. On the right is the spring and on the left is the fall. The active cases in our region are almost 10 times greater this spring semester as compared to college restart back in August. So we should expect to see more cases on campus compared to what we saw in the fall. And this week we're reporting 65 new cases across all of our college campuses. Turning to our Vermont forecast for the next six weeks, we continue to see improvement with week over week uh, projections continuing to decrease. And although our most recent case data suggests that we will uh, beat this forecast over the weeks ahead, we do expect cases to remain elevated for much of the month of February. So it's something for all Vermonters to keep in mind. And finally, as uh, Secretary Smith said, we've made great progress on the vaccine front. Uh, Vermont continues to stand out nationally, ranking number two in the Northeast in terms of vaccine administration and number six nationally on that same mark. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Levine.
Thank you, Commissioner Pichek, and I will probably reinforce some of the same points you made. So you've seen that our cases seem to be reflecting national trends, easing their way down. Today we're reporting 108 cases and a low seven-day positivity rate of 1.9 percent. As you just seen, modeling projections don't see the state counts going much lower over the month of February. We're also seeing deaths increase at a much lower rate, which of course is also good news in distinction, contradistinction to some of the rest of the country. I've mentioned previously, and we saw recent evidence for that, that this has to do with fewer cases in long-term care facilities in January as compared with December. The one thing that still remains a concern is, in comparison with national trends as well, our hospitalization rates. Hospitalizations were at 60 yesterday and are at 64 today, with 12 patients currently in the ICU. As you've seen, a large portion of these are in Bennington County. The rest of the state is actually exhibiting some stability. Fortunately, Southwest Vermont Medical Center is coping very well with this added clinical load, and tertiary centers in the region have accepted some of the highest acuity patients in transfer. We continue to monitor that situation very closely, in addition to the higher case numbers generally in that part of the state. Our data teams have not pinpointed any one cause for the spread in Bennington County, though we did know of some larger gatherings in early December, before the holidays, that led to some small outbreaks. Additionally, a percentage of these cases are related to New York residents who either work or receive their medical care in the Bennington area. Examination of COVID-19 case activity in this county looks much more like the adjoining New York counties you saw on the heat map than those of Vermont. We're also seeing that out-of-state ski business accounts for some of the cases as well, but because many of these are visitors to the state and they're only here for a day or two, all we see are the impacts of spread to restaurants or work sites. We're working to ensure that Bennington County has sufficient testing and information to help slow the spread of COVID. What we're seeing tells us we must work harder on the containment front, which begins with access to testing. The test sites in Bennington are often busy, but frankly not filled to capacity. We are working to pilot other sites throughout the region and perhaps later expand ski resort testing in the county as well. And we are looking to move to a site in the northern part of the county to increase access for that population. We've been very focused on vaccination lately, a complex yet extremely positive stage of our pandemic response. But we simply can't ignore the work we've been doing and still need to do to stop the virus. You know it by now, and it's as critically important today as it has been for almost a year now. Six foot spaces, masks on faces, uncrowded places. We also still need to avoid gathering with people we don't live with right now. Thousands of cases and dozens of outbreaks. We know this is a highly infectious virus, and we can't always know if someone has been exposed. COVID does find its way into that, into gatherings, and once it does, it spreads easily, and one person can easily infect one or sometimes two others. And then it spreads again from person to person into households, workplaces, houses of worship, and beyond, leading to more concerning community spread, which is exactly what we see each night in our case counts. We've worked so hard at this for so many months now, Please don't slip up now, not when we're so much closer to being protected by a vaccine. And speaking of which, there is even more positive news on the vaccine front, this time from Johnson & Johnson. We expect, possibly later this week, that they will be seeking emergency youth author authorization from the FDA. 
Early information indicates that the vaccine, which has the benefit of being administered in a single dose, was 72% effective in the U.S. at preventing moderate to severe COVID-19. 85% effective in preventing severe disease and completely effective in preventing hospitalization and death as of day 28. This was across races, ages, and multiple variants. The trial enrolled almost 44,000 participants and included 468 symptomatic cases. There were no cases of anaphylaxis, and interestingly, from a scientific perspective, there were actually more serious adverse events in the placebo group. We're also still watching the cases that have surfaced at colleges and universities. A number of athletic teams have had outbreaks and had their seasons paused, including UVM, Castleton, and Norwich. With regard to high school sports competition, we have just barely reached the day 14 mark since opening phase two. Our EPI team is in the process of preparing analyses of cases both before we opened phase two and since. We will look at both team cases, impact of cases on teams, and impact of cases on schools. Our one university outbreak continues to be Norwich, which has now reported 94 cases. We understand that many students travel to Vermont from other parts of the country which have higher prevalence of COVID-19. They then encountered further risk through the actual process of travel. In some cases, they learned that family members tested positive after the student had already left for Vermont. We expected to see more cases in the spring semester than the fall, knowing how much more virus activity has been happening throughout the country and region. Though these cases are concerning, this is, this is exactly why we require returning colleges, college students to be tested and quarantined. This helps us identify cases, ensure they isolate themselves, and ensures that their close contacts quarantine before the semester even begins. The university appears to have sufficient isolation and quarantine housing and their new president and administration have delivered effective messages and guidance to students detailing their responsibilities in quarantine. In some instances, disciplinary actions have been taken. We are working closely with the university to refine testing protocols, especially for close contacts, on top of the surveillance testing already in place. We're examining the specifics of cases and the potential spread on campus to guide our recommendations. Our outbreak response and prevention team continues its work with the school with containment as the goal. I will say that the marked slowing of case growth in the past several days may indeed be an encouraging sign. The health department is also in the process of submitting some specimens from these cases for genomic sequencing to see if any involve new variants which are mutations among the COVID-19 virus. I do not yet have any update on results of this, but with the spread of these variants around the country, we do expect to see one or more in Vermont eventually. On the national scene, the experience is three variants, 471 cases in 33 jurisdictions. The CDC is now looking towards a new goal of sequencing 7,000 cases weekly. I'll stop there and turn it over to the question and answers. We'll take questions and um, questions right now. Um, thank you, Secretary. So probably um, starting for Commissioner Harrington, um, I understand there's been a bit of a mix-up with some of the uh, 1099G forms. Um, I'm wondering, if, first off, if you can guess, give, up, give, up, give us an update as to uh, how many forms and how many people have been affected, um, 
how long uh, it's going to take the state to send out new um, forms and potentially how much it's going to cost as well. Right. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, did you get that question? I believe I did. So uh, let me do my best to respond. Uh, and I think this is a good opportunity to just reiterate some of the information that was provided. Uh, yesterday uh, in a media briefing as well as on our website. Um, so we had a situation where uh, when information from our mainframe system uh, was processed and then printed uh, in the printing and mailing process of our 1099 tax documents that go to individuals who receive benefits during the 2020 calendar year, uh, that file uh, was corrupted, uh, and what ended up happening was individuals began receiving uh, 1099 documents from the department where the name and address uh, were incorrect, either on the front of the document, uh, the part on the envelope, or once opened, uh, it had incorrect name and Social Security number on the inside. Um, so uh, the department became aware of this early yesterday morning and immediately started working on a response plan. Uh, at this time, we are asking uh, and planning to recall uh, all of the 1099s that have been sent out to date. Uh, that's roughly about uh, 80,000 uh, 1099s that were mailed. Of the 80,000 that were mailed, approximately 55,000 were corrupt. Uh, and then a smaller subset of those included uh, a corresponding name and correct social security number, which leads us to believe that there is the potential for uh, some incidences of, of uh, the improper release of protected uh, information from the department. So uh, we are working right now to communicate with claimants, uh, but the instructions to to claimants are uh, if you receive a letter from the Department of Labor and the name and address uh, is incorrect or any portion of the name and address is incorrect uh, on the envelope, please do not open the envelope and set it aside. You will receive follow-up communications along with a letter and a pre-stamped, pre-addressed envelope for returning that 1099 to the department. If the information on the envelope is correct, and you open the envelope and find out that the information on the 1099 on the inside uh, is incorrect in that it either doesn't have your correct name uh, or correct social security number. We ask that you protect, uh, put that aside in a protected place. And again, uh, you will receive a communication and mailing from the department with instructions uh, for uh, how to return that uh, in a self-addressed stamped envelope to the department. For those individuals where we have been able to identify that there is the potential of a uh, compromising situation of their data, um, including their name and social security number, uh, we will contact those individuals separately uh, and walk them through a process for how to protect uh, and monitor their information, but also how to enroll in ID protection services through the department. Uh, we expect uh, the immediate notification and recall effort um, to occur over the next two weeks, along with um, the outreach notification of individuals where their information may have been compromised and enrollment in protection services if, uh, if requested. And then uh, we also have the process of reissuing um, new 1099s um, under a controlled process uh, by the end of the month. Um, so again, uh, a couple different actions taking place over the coming days and weeks, uh, and we will be communicating that both on the website uh, as well as uh, to individuals uh, directly. Kelvin, um, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, so it, it appears, as if, if I'm hearing you correctly, Commissioner, it sounds like this is um, another problem from the UI mainframe. How do we make sure this doesn't happen again? Yeah, so it, it isn't necessarily um, directly related to the mainframe, although all roads lead back to antiquated systems. Um, traditionally, here at the department, uh, we would process somewhere between six and 8,000 1099s, uh, and people would receive one 1099. Obviously, 2020 had presented uh, a much more uh, difficult and complex problem 
uh, in that uh, we are now issuing 180,000 uh, 1099s in total. And instead of one 1099, people will receive multiple 1099s due to the, the extension and expansion of various benefit programs. And the problem is that all these programs uh, don't reside within one system. Uh, they reside in multiple systems. And, and part of that is obviously due to the age of the mainframe. Um, the other issue uh, that is impacted because of the age of, of this system is that many of our processes in, include manual steps in those processes and the transmission of data to and from the mainframe and to various other ancillary programs and systems. And so, you know, unfortunately, given the complexity uh, and um, and kind of the, the outgrowth of these multiple systems and steps and processes, we've simply um, expanded the opportunity for um, you know, for, for failure actions to occur and missteps to occur in each one of these processes due to the, the level of manual effort that occurs. So uh, we are um, looking at uh, additional quality control and quality assurance measures that can be put in place. Uh, both to review the incident that occurred uh, so that we can learn from it and correct um, gaps in the system. We are also looking at long-term uh, quality control and quality assurance um, uh, efforts that can be implemented, again, to ensure that um, once we have uh, received uh, the 1099s that were improperly sent, uh, reissuing uh, 1099s that are, are true and accurate. Um, so uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us over the coming uh, weeks and months, um, and uh, we're, we're neck deep in, in trying to move through this process as quickly as we can to get information um, to claimants and impacted individuals uh, in an expedited manner. Secretary, if I may, just one more. So, Commissioner, um, you know, potentially there's quite a few Social Security numbers that were assigned to the wrong or sent out to the wrong people i guess in in an instance like this what what does accountability look like i didn't catch the last part of that calvin uh, what was the actual question part what what does accountability look like yeah so i mean accountability uh from the department's perspective is we obviously have an obligation under the law uh, to notify uh, the Attorney General's office as well as the IRS, but more importantly, we have an obligation uh, to uh, to notify the impacted individuals. Um, you know, I, from an accountability perspective, um, I think our investigation of, of the process and what occurred will bear out where the, the failure in the process occurred. But obviously, at the end of the day, uh, they are mailed from the department, which means um, I am accountable for what leaves in the department. Uh, and, and we'll review that process and, and different pieces that were involved in that process ongoing. You know, I think at this point, it's, it's certainly too early, and, and I'm not really a big fan of pointing fingers. Um, you know, we've, we've got a very uh, talented and committed crew here um, that worked tirelessly over the past month. Um, to to get this effort out the door, um, and and certainly uh, there are always the opportunity for mistakes. Um, and, and if we find that there was something intentionally done, uh, or or um, someone uh, did not follow a, a procedure, we'll 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 identify that and move forward. But at this point, um, I think we're all focused on uh, how to notify claimants as quickly as possible. Uh, how to get them uh, the instructions they need uh, to move forward and how to get them new information. And obviously for those uh, where there may have been um, an improper release of their uh, private information, getting them the protection as, as quickly as possible. And that is our main focus right now. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, since you're on the line, uh, are, are, is your department ready to be uh, as transparent as possible as far as how many people uh, actually were affected and if there were any data breach uh, or uh, stealing of identity at all? We, we will be as transparent as we can under the law and within our uh, capability. And the reason I say that is I can tell you um, to, today how many uh, 1099 documents left the building uh, and were put in the mail. What I can't tell you is how many people that represents at the moment, because 
uh, we have people who were of those 1099s that were mailed. Um, there were in the, you know there were incidences where someone where three of those 1099s could have gone to one person. And so we will have to do a much deeper dive uh, into the mailing of the 80,000 1099 um, to to understand what the true population looks like. Um, I, I think the other piece uh, and the part that makes this a little bit more complex is that um, you know the the you have uh, the Department of Labor and, and the Unemployment Insurance Program. You also have our technical team that works with our mainframe and pulls the data from the mainframe. And then we have a series of uh, other individuals, um, whether it be uh, the print shop or here at the department, who are working to uh, print the massive amount of 1099 uh, and then um, stuff those envelopes and mail those envelopes. And so there were, there were many people, um, you know, involved in this process from various departments and agencies uh, working to get the 1099s out the door. And so that just adds a, a layer of complexity when we're trying to fully understand, um, you know, where, where the, the, the um, you know, the separation was in the process and the failure in the process was. But we'll be conducting that review and, and certainly provide whatever information we can. I guess for you, Mike, uh, do we know what the number of uh, vaccines going forward for the next few weeks are? Have you heard from the feds? We, we've had the 10,300 that we've heard for the next two weeks that we've heard from the feds. Obviously, the governor's meeting with the feds right now, um, but uh, we're going forward with that number. We haven't had any commitment beyond that n number. We, uh, obviously, as you know, we've, we've uh, uh, done all our modeling on 8,800 uh, doses as we move forward, but um, we hope to hear some more. And have you heard from the guard at all, or or has the governor uh, approached the guard as far as uh, distribution goes? We have the guard in reserve for distribution. If we got a massive amount of vaccine, we would deploy the guard in 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 our in our planning. We we've actually planned to have the guard as a reserve um, in case we do get um, more vaccine than we had anticipated. So um, the guard is a very important partner in this. If we get more vaccine, thank you. Stewart, NBC Five. Thanks, uh, Secretary Smith. Um, can you? Tell us when school teachers are going to get vaccinated. Well, I think what the governor has said, and I think this is the way that we've um, approached this, we have done age banding, and uh, the age banding from 65 uh, to 70 and 70 to 75 and 75 above. We're in the 75 above now, which is the first age ban. We will get through that. And then we've talked about those with underlying conditions from 16 to 64. Um, and then the governor said he's open to discussions about what comes next. Um, I have said that we'll be through 65 uh, by the start of the spring, and I still believe that's the case. We still have to get through the uh, uh, 16 to 64 with the underlying conditions that uh, Dr. Levine had talked about. So we're open to discussions after the age banding and the underlying conditions and to talk about that at some point. So start of spring, I mean, I don't know how long the, the 18 plus with the underlying conditions might take, but is, I mean, the, as you know, the NEA is, is talking about an April time frame. Is that in the realm? Well, we'll talk, we'll continue our discussions with the NEA. Actually, I'm meeting with them tomorrow um, to do, have some discussions with them on, uh, on various uh, aspects of the vaccine program. I, I think it's too soon, really, to talk about specifics on, given the fact that we don't know when Johnson & Johnson is coming, we don't know when other vaccines may be coming to the market. Um, but we're certainly open to talking to uh, various individuals about various things. Look, um, I know that teachers want to get back to classroom teaching um, five days a week, and I know that students want to get back five days a week. In fact, we, we need to get students back on all levels. The grade school levels we're doing fairly well at. We need to get back students at all levels. 
um, and the sooner we can, the better better it is for everyone. So we'll 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 go in with that mindset um, as we look. But it's important, Stuart. I don't want to lose sight on important of the strategy that we have: reduce death, and and um, and the strategy we have is through the age banding to reduce death, reduce serious illness, and get us back um, to a place faster with this strategy than we would in sort of a scattered uh, shot strategy. All right. And just uh, listening to Commissioner Harrington, a uh, thought occurs, and, and we, like everybody else, I'm sure, have been hearing from people who are not happy about the 1099G mess up. Is there any way, if, if I get somebody else's Social Security number and I go out and try to create a, an account or do something phony, can you, will you know that you sent somebody else's Social Security number uh, to me? Are, can, is that traceable in some way? Uh, don't you want to put people on notice, uh, you know, not to do the criminal? Commissioner Harrington? Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Appreciate the question. Um, you know, the immediate thing and, uh, is that anyone, regardless of this situation, but obviously in, in light of this situation, um, people should monitor the activity on their accounts, uh, whether it be banking accounts or credit card accounts. Um, I, additionally, they should also consider security freezes on their credit reports and credit scores. Um, just given rampant fraud that is occurring across the country right now. Um, specific to this incident, I completely understand um, people's frustration. I want them to know that I share in that frustration. Um, you know, this, this was, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, I, I could never have imagined would have occurred um, coming out of the process we had in place. Um, and they have my uh, unwavering commitment that we will review the process, correct the process, and make sure we implement safeguards to prevent it from happening in the future. Um, I think along those lines, we do have a way uh, to identify um, the, the population where uh, we sent a 1099 that had a person's Social Security number and that same person's uh, name uh, on the same document and where that document um, may have been delivered to someone other than the name and social on the document. Uh, and in cases where the name and the social match, um, but the recipient was not that person, um, we will be notifying uh, the, the person whose identity um, potentially could have been compromised in that sense. And I say potentially because um, it may not have uh, been opened and released and that and part of our protection measure is having people return these documents to the department so that they can be um, destroyed uh, properly. Um, and we will also be reaching out to those individuals to, to offer additional um, support services for identity protection. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to Lisa at the Valley Reporter. Good morning. Looking at the hospital data recently, it shows that despite declining case numbers and hospitalizations, the number of people in the ICU has increased in January and looks to stay elevated through the end of this month. Why is that? And is it possible to provide the demographics of those who are hospitalized as well as those who are in the ICU? Commissioner Pichek or Commissioner Levine, one or the other. I'm glad you asked a question about hospitalizations because either I misspoke or, or I misspoke. But uh, I was uh, notified that I may have said we went from 60 yesterday to 64 today, but we went to 54 today. So I'm not sure what I said, but the accurate number is 54. Uh, so seeing more people in the ICU, um, Obviously, that implies an increase in severity of the condition of the person. The reality is most of those patients probably belong in an ICU. I know we had said at one time that there are times that an ICU room <clears throat> provides an isolation room and a negative pressure ventilation room, which are criteria for 
what we want for a COVID patient being hospitalized. But we should assume most of these patients just have a severity of illness greater than uh, would be warranted for someone on a hospital ward. The nice news about that is rarely, occasionally though, ventilators are used for these patients. Um, you may recall from early in the pandemic, we were, we as a country were panicking about ventilators and all kinds of entrepreneurs were out there trying to convert whatever business they had into building ventilators. Uh, now ventilators aren't such a big issue. Um, we've learned a lot more about the care of the patients, the uh, way to manage their oxygenation needs and their ventilation needs that don't always involve using uh, a ventilator itself, which is great. And we have medications we can administer that may interfere with some of the inflammatory response of their body that had led to a uh, respiratory distress syndrome related to the virus. So um, I think we said during our presentations that we showed, in fact, Commissioner Petrak had the uh, slide that showed where the Bennington cases were going on an uptick and the rest of the state was pretty stable. And that is really the pattern that we have. So I'm not sure I can give more granularity to your answer than, than I just did. Um, the ICU usage is obviously not just in Bennington, it's all over the state, but it's again distributed. So is possible to provide aggregated demographics for those who are in the ICU to avoid potential HIPAA violations if they could be aggregated from December to the end of January? Oh, just over time to, to see it in aggregate for the state, how many were in an ICU at one point in yes. time versus another? Oh, yes. and, I'm and, sure, yeah. And their age, age band and their um, sex, yes. Yeah, why don't, why don't we get back to you with that, sure. That would be great. And my next question is also for you, Dr. Levine. Could you elaborate your, on your comments about Bennington and ski resorts and visitors who are leaving COVID behind? Yeah, so I mean, the reality is we have a lot of visitors to the parts of the state. Um, and we know that there have been, uh, not only on the site of a ski resort, but in the communities uh, that are part of the ski resorts, cases that show up in work sites and in restaurants to the point where in one or two towns, uh, several of those had to close due to staffing issues. Um, so we can only hypothesize that there are more cases in those areas providing the nidus for community transmission to occur in those areas um, at a higher rate than it seems to be occurring in some other places. So that was the intent of that comment. And is it possible to quantify that or those cases? Yeah, it's really, it's really challenging to do that um, because once community transmission is occurring, it's hard to know um, from whom to whom did it spread? And was it from somebody who actually doesn't live in Vermont versus somebody who's part of the community in Vermont? So it's a challenge to do that. We know that in Bennington County, um, I believe it was uh, close to, but under 20% of cases seem to be from the New York side, but that doesn't mean those were skiers. Those could have been uh, people who get their care in Vermont or who work actually across the border in Vermont. Uh, so it's a little hard to quantitate, um, you know, from one set of uh, people here for a certain purpose, if you will. Thank you very much. And I'll reach out via email on the other deck. Great. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, sorry I'm late. I just wanted to jump in quickly um, before we continue answering questions. I was just on a call with the National Governors Association and White House officials discussing vaccine distribution amongst other topics. Um, it was a very productive conversation and I appreciate the Biden administration's engagement uh, with my fellow governors and me. Uh, this is uh, part of their promise to update us on a weekly basis. So um, 
unfortunately today was uh, part of our, you know, it uh, uh, connected with our, our press conference. Um, but we did hear some, some good news. Uh, our doses uh, will be increased another 5%, and that's in addition to the 16% increase announced last week uh, for a total of more than 20%. If you do the math and compound and so forth, it's probably around 22%. Uh, it's not 21, but 22 over where we were several weeks ago. Uh, they also reiterated uh, that this would be uh, they would uh, they would promise this over a three-week duration, uh, which will be tremendously important to us as we plan ahead. Uh, that's what we had asked them to do, and they are following through on that promise. So for the next three weeks, we'll be receiving uh, the this additional uh, 5% uh, on top of, again, the 16% from before. So in addition to the 20-plus percent increase, uh, they will also be providing us with the tools to get the extra dose uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which is uh, potentially about uh, 15 to 20 percent, I think, more uh, per vial. So that's not included in this, but they are providing all the tools we need to do that. And I believe they did that this week, uh, but they are going to continue to do that uh, in the future. Uh, they will also... Um, be retroactively uh, providing 100% uh, reimbursement for certain FEMA-approved uh, operations. Uh, I think National Guard, in the beginning, uh, we were at uh, 75, uh, 25. Uh, the states had to provide 25% uh, reimbursement. The, um, the Biden administration, uh, when uh, President Biden was sworn in, one of the first actions was to commit to 100% at that point. Uh, and now it's going to be retroactive uh, back to January of uh, 2020, which will mean uh, millions of dollars for Vermont. Uh, we don't uh, know all the details, and we'll look into that and hopefully be able to update you on what that could mean. But, uh, but I would um, safely say it's, uh, it's millions uh, of dollars that will be coming back to Vermont in some respects. Uh, also, beginning in the next couple of weeks, uh, the federal government will also be delivering additional vaccine directly to pharmacies. This is a somewhat of a pilot project based on what they've done before in, in 1A. Um, so this is uh, the, the first phase will be about a million doses uh, throughout the country. It will be distributed on a per capita basis. Uh, so that's another 10%. Uh, that we should be getting. So I would say around um, 900 to 1,000 doses uh, that will be distributed to the, to the pharmacies to be uh, utilized here in Vermont. So again, uh, every little bit helps. Uh, this will be substantial, and we'll see how it works. Again, the details will be rolling out, but we expect that to happen over the next two weeks. So again, uh, this is uh, just preliminary information, uh, hot off the press, so to speak. And we'll have more details in the days to come. But uh, suffice it to say, this is uh, good news for us here in Vermont and throughout the country. So I appreciate the collaboration with the White House and look forward to receiving more doses so we can vaccinate Vermonters as fast as possible and start getting back to whatever normal is. Um, so I thank you, and we'll get back to questions at this time. Um, hi, morning or afternoon, everybody. Uh, Governor, on the on your the twenty two percent more vaccine, Secretary Smith gave a number earlier. Can you put a number on that figure? How many you expect to be? How many doses you expect to be receiving for the next three weeks? Well, again, uh, if you take in, in roughly, we had nine thousand in the beginning. We added sixteen percent on top of that. And then you add another five percent to that. So I think we're probably around 11,000, um, 11, I would, I'm just doing it in my head. So I'm going to look over at Mike okay. Pichek. What's that? 10,800. 10, so I'm still be able to do math in my oh. head. So around 11,000. Okay, okay, well, good for you. I need a calculator to do math. <laughs> um, anyway, my other question for Dr. Levine, you were, you've touched on this a little bit, and uh, the question from Lisa Loomis touched on it too. But have you seen, or touched on my question? 
What is the what is the theme running through your contact tracing community right now? I mean, is there any thing that you can point out? I mean, is it ski areas? Is it small group gatherings? Or is it just community transmission, you know, randomly passing someone on the road who uh, is expelling virus? I would agree with community transmission, though your description of it may, may not be complex enough because um, it's probably not from random events like that. It still probably is from more concentrated uh, exposure to an individual within six feet for 15 minutes uh, in duration. But yes, uh, we look at our reports every night and we see continuing uh, involvement uh, to a high level of work sites around Vermont. But again, these are an individual at a work site. Uh, they're not an entire work site uh, brought down by the virus and closed up. Um, we find it in uh, houses of worship. We find it in uh, schools occasionally. We find it in our uh, healthcare facilities, whether they be long-term care or, or other healthcare facilities. So um, it's just, a manifestation of the fact that when we look at the graph that we saw earlier today, where we are in the last several months is way different than where we were in the summer and early fall with regard to how much virus is prevalent across the state. And um, you're, you're going to see community transmission under those circumstances. We are still um, following, okay, you know, we're still following uh, a fair number of outbreaks, but I would say that the outbreaks are not driving the uh, cases. The outbreaks may be responsible for 10 or 15 percent of all of the cases, but the rest of the cases do not have any association with an outbreak. Okay, and then uh, the, the theme I've asked you several times over the last few weeks, I'll ask it one more time, although it might still be early. Um, uh, I'm, have you seen any empirical evidence yet that the vaccines are working and in reducing the uh, incidence of the disease? Yeah, that's, a, that's a huge challenge at this early juncture, to be honest. I would love to say that what we're seeing in the long-term cares is related to the vaccine, but that would be a little guesswork and a little premature. But again, our most... Uh, vulnerable part of long-term care is the skilled nursing facility. And I believe now the majority of them, if not all, have completed uh, dose two. So they are in that stage where, you know, a few days beyond, or a week or two beyond dose two, uh, those people should be relatively well protected from developing uh, significant COVID disease. So I think we're gonna start to see that impact and that's why Secretary Smith and I are really moving full speed ahead on a project to see how we can have that benefit pay off in the long-term care facilities with regards to uh, bringing life there a little bit back to normal, whether it be with regards to communal dining, visitation, uh, group activities, things of that sort. Uh, there is a pathway to go forward uh, working with uh, the federal government and CMS um, and testing to make sure that we do it the right way. But we'll be, we'll, we're beginning to have those discussions now, now that we've just finally reached the end of uh, the second dose for those particular facilities. Okay, great. Thank you very much, as always. I, I think it's also important to note uh, in terms of contact tracing, uh, we have actually increased our ability to contact trace with the help of the National Guard and others, and we built upon that over the last couple of months, where some other states, many other states, uh, have had to uh, put away uh, their contact tracing because they were overwhelmed. I think New Hampshire did uh, as well. I'm not sure if they're back to contact tracing, uh, but, uh, but Vermont was well suited uh, for this and uh, well prepared, and, and I think that it, it will go a long ways uh, towards trying to mitigate this as best we can. Thank you. Next, we have Peter Hirschfeld, BPR. Governor, the, the House is working on a yield bill 
today um, that, that reduces pretty significantly the property tax increase from, from what folks had been anticipating or looking at a few weeks ago, um, but doesn't eliminate it altogether. Uh, you said in your budget address that you don't want to see any increase in statewide property taxes. And I'm wondering what the mechanism um, you propose, what the mechanism is that, that you would propose achieving that by. Yeah, I'm going to give a, a lot of credit uh, to the House uh, for putting that number out there. I think it's a, a good sign to the uh, communities uh, throughout Vermont that we are uh, not going to see a substantial increase. And I believe uh, we will get down to uh, not having any increase at all. And, and I would say that they might uh, agree with that, but uh, a little bit too early at this point. We'll see uh, as uh, time goes on. Uh, the education fund, I think, will continue to be overflowing in some respects so i don't see any reason to see any increase but but it's too early for them to do that but this uh, this sends a signal uh, to others that we're, we're pretty close but your sense is that we're going to see uh revenues improve such that uh you won't have to have any sort of outside intervention to achieve a zero percent increase that that's my feeling yes Thank you. All right, and we're going to go to Mike Donahue, but just a quick time check. It is 12.10, and we still have 17, almost our entire queue left to get through. You didn't do very well while Sorry. I was away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, and uh, first, just a quick thank you on the follow-up when Dr. Levine couldn't remember the other day which hospital had the outbreak in mid-January. Turns out it was Copley Hospital in Morrisville. Uh, the health department told us finally. So thank you very much for getting back to us. Today, I'd like Commissioner Harrington. <clears throat> uh, the Islander has received multiple inquiries from across the state about the major problems on the 1099, and I know you addressed it earlier with Calvin. And, but one woman in particular was really upset, noting this is at least the second known time in just a few months that the Vermont Labor Department has sent her personal identification information, including Social Security, off to some unknown stranger. And she, <clears throat> and probably others, wonder when the state can stop blaming phone systems and computers and actually hold somebody accountable. Um, you did say manual labor was involved in the screw-up. Uh, you also said you don't like to point fingers, but isn't that the problem that nobody has ever held accountable? It's, it's not their social security number or date of birth floating around out there, maybe used for criminal conduct or fraud. And secondly, do you have an estimate on how much this latest Labor Department problem is going to cost Vermont taxpayers? Uh, thanks, uh, Mike. Appreciate the question. Uh, I'll again extend um, my uh, sincere regret uh, and apology for the situation that occurred. Um, you know, it, I'm hesitant to associate blame uh, because we are still in the midst of reviewing the situation that occurred. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, when we talk about accountability, it is important that we um, do hold, uh, you know, into ourselves or individuals accountable for the quality of their work. Um, and so I'm not I'm not trying to dodge the question there, but um, it's really early in the process right now. It's, you know, it's been about 24 hours, a little over um, since we were made aware of the issue. Um, I think we're, you know, we're continuing to review um, which file um, was improperly handled uh, and who handled that file. Um, and, and certainly we can talk about um, accountability at, at some future point, but I think right now the priority is is notifying these claimants and, and correcting the issue. Um, you know, I, I certainly understand uh, and uh, I think I said earlier, you know, we can we can talk about the impact that antiquated systems and, and multiple systems and, and manual processes have in contributing, um, but they are not the, the sole uh, issue here. Um, and I think it's really hard to lay blame uh, on any one uh, system or individual uh, in in this process. Um, although we will conduct and are conducting a a 
thorough review of the process to to figure exactly um, where the the disconnect happened and the failure occurred. And and I will, um, you know, I'm happy to share uh, information as we learn more about how this this unfolded. Um, you know, un unfortunately, it's probably likely the most simplest of of um, processes um, that lead to the the largest uh, impact. Uh, and um, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't be surprising in this case, uh, given the amount of data that is needing to be transferred and, and handled in multiple different ways in order to um, you know conduct the types of complex. Um, processes we're doing. So um, in terms of, of accountability, I, I will own that. Uh, although, um, you know, I think what people really want to know is, is where did the, where did the failure occur and, and why um, aren't there better control mechanisms in place for assuring quality? And, and that's what we're trying to get to. Um, and, and we will move forward with that eye on, on quality control and quality assurance. Okay. Thank you. And Secretary Smith, uh, thank you very much for your efforts in trying to get the vaccine sites finally brought to Grand Isle County after the health department ignored it. Uh, but we heard this morning <clears throat> there'll be vaccine shots at the Alberg Volunteer Fire Department on February 12th. Wondering if that's the only time. We, unfortunately, we've heard other vaccine sites in Grand Isle won't be created until sometime in March, which is well beyond the deadline for 75 year olds to get their shots. And uh, the health department told me multiple times the vaccine will only come to Grand Isle if the state gets additional uh, shots from the feds. But clearly vaccines are earmarked for Grand Isle residents driving to Burlington or St. Albans. It was good news to hear the governor say the White House is promising more vaccines. So I don't know if Governor or Secretary Smith can there be a pledge that Grand Isle residents will actually be assured they will get their fair share in this extra dose. Yeah, I mean, Mike, this is Mike Smith. We um, we have established a uh, vaccine site in Alberg. My impression was that it was ongoing. I will double check that just to make sure. If it's ongoing, then it, it solves uh, what you're talking about. So we will, Grand Isle residents, Will will there be others? I know they were looking at Grand Isle School and the health department stopped at South Hero School yesterday, but looks like it's not going to be until March, which again is beyond the 75 year old yeah. deadline for getting their shots. Mike, you brought you brought oh, you gave me a week to get the first one up. Let me see what I can do with the second one. How's that? <laughs> Fair enough. I'll give you a week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Ed? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Levine, uh, could you just provide a little bit more uh, clarity ab about the statement you made that uh, they would be opening up some of the uh, assisted care facilities to allow people to uh, congregate? Is that only going to be for people who are current residents, or can family members visit during those times, and do they have to be vaccinated as well? Yeah, thank you for the question. What I did was try to give you a glimpse at the future, not at the present for one thing, so none of this is operative now. Um, and um, all of this has to be uh, in compliance with CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, guidance and regulations. So um, this is our roadmap is what I'm describing. Now that we have the skilled nursing facilities completely vaccinated with regard to those who live there, um, this is the time for us to now try to find the way forward. You mentioned assisted living. There's assisted living and other residential care facilities that are in process still. So many of those people have not received their second dose yet. So they're at a little later stage of development in terms of the way the progression went for vaccinating long-term care facilities. But um, 
there must be a way for us to move forward uh, even before family members get vaccinated because obviously um, while many family members may actually be old enough or, or qualify otherwise to get a vaccine in the near future, uh, there'll be, I'm sure, plenty that will not have yet received their vaccine. But that doesn't mean we can't improve the life for those who are living in those facilities with the activities and social arrangements that can be made within the facility. And it also doesn't mean that visitation is off the table, uh, because obviously we did do vis visitation mostly outdoors with distancing and masking um, before the winter arrived. And we clearly can still move in that direction again, as long as we uh, do all the uh, boxes getting checked for CMS and do the right thing. So that's just a glimpse of the future. And we're hoping it's the nearer future, not the distant future. Okay, thank you very much. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a simple question. I asked it before, but I still can't seem to get an answer. Um, there were three temperature monitors at the Springfield Hospital, uh, and we understand that two of them read within the acceptable range of 2 to 8 degrees yeah. Celsius, and one read 9.1, and we're f trying to find out which was accurate, which was inaccurate. I'm uh, going to ask Dr. Levine if he can. I'm not going to answer your question because uh, that's getting down to a level of um, data that I don't have in front of me. But I do want to comment on the whole incident, if I may. Um, and, and it'll get to your question in a, in a in a less specific way. If there's anything that this episode reveals, it's the complexity of what's going on right now and the complexity in an environment that's moving very fast. So you have a new vaccine, you have new storage requirements for vaccines that are generally different than ever before. You have new healthcare partnerships in terms of the delivery of the vaccine to the population. You have a new vaccine manufacturer who's actually not done vaccines ever before. And you have uh, some federal partners who are in new territory as well. So I just want to emphasize this is very complex. Um, we shouldn't be pointing fingers at Springfield by any means because this could happen anywhere. And um, a lot of things were turned up. So basically, we understand that um, when something like this occurs, you need to do what we call a root cause analysis to really understand all of the processes at play and where corrections need to be made and where things are going smoothly. The uh, health department's immunization staff did in fact do a site visit after this event occurred. Um, there were issues regarding uh, first storing the vaccine in a freezer and then a refrigerator uh, that were uncovered. Uh, because we preferred that start out in the freezer. There were issues with the refrigeration system and that is being replaced. There were issues about the thermometer and you're talking about the sensors and there's actually now a um, new device that will allow the health department in its immunization program to monitor the temperature real time from afar and provide alerts if the temperature wavers outside of the range that it's supposed to be in. Um, the hospital has been very cooperative in uh, providing us with the information we needed, correcting its storage and management practices and monitoring. And um, basically, the bottom line is, things weren't all that awry there. As I tried to point out earlier, um, from an immunization program that for decades has been monitoring the whole array of immunizations that people get nowadays, um, this was not an unexpected event. It's seen frequently throughout the course of every year with different types of vaccines. And it was great that we could find it early in the course of our uh, working with these new vaccines as well. So I can't tell you exactly which sensor uh, that uh, was at play, but I can tell you that the system has essentially been updated and will provide us with the information we need real time to prevent 
issues like that from occurring again. It, it does, does someone know which of the sensors we're working and could they let me know what that is? Yeah, I can get back to the people who actually uh, conducted the site visit. That'd be great, thank you. Hi, can, yeah, this is Derek. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Derek. Okay, yeah. Uh, this question is for the governor. Um, last week, uh, New York State Attorney General uh, uh, issued a report that criticized uh, Governor Cuomo's um, uh, handling of nursing homes during the pandemic in, in a few ways. And, and one of those uh, ways was the, uh, the decision to grant civil immunity to uh, long-term care facilities uh, for problems uh, related to the pandemic. Um, and the attorney general there uh, said that the, that civil immunity clause, you know, may have uh, incentivized these homes to make uh, financially motivated decisions, uh, for instance, you know, admitting patients, uh, even though they may not have had uh, the staffing uh, to care for them adequately. Uh, we have a similar provision um, in your executive orders here. I'm wondering uh, if, uh, if you've given any thought to when you may uh, rescind uh, that immunity. Um. I don't know. We haven't had a, a discussion about that provision in particular, and, and we can we can confer with the general counsel and others amongst the uh, uh, senior staff and and interested parties. Um, but uh, but I would say we, we want to get out of the uh, executive order completely uh, at some point in the near future as quick as possible. So. Uh, everything that we're doing with the vaccines and the vaccination rate and mitigation steps we're taking uh, will lead us to that point, which will then uh, eliminate the uh, executive order altogether. So uh, I'm I'm hopeful it's within, you know, we're not talking a, a year, we're talking within months uh, before we get to that point. So, but we haven't had the conversation specifically about the uh, civil uh, immunity. Okay, and as a follow-up, obviously there were some problems identified uh, in, in one home in Elderwood. I'm wondering if you're aware of, uh, if you've been hearing uh, complaints or reports of problems uh, involving care at other homes in the state. I may uh, refer to Secretary Smith on that, see if he's heard anything. Derek, I haven't heard of anything specific about various homes. We did recognize, and you may recall, we did recognize that um, when we had this second wave or third wave, I guess it would be uh, here, and it started hitting um, skilled nursing facilities and others, residential care and assisted living as well, that it was having really impacts on um, staffing levels at uh, various institution so we we as you know we we established this staffing pool at the state level to sort of intercede and help out with those staffing areas and that has helped tremendously um, we also have the hopper team the teams that the rapid response teams that come into the facilities to help out but I haven't heard of anything specific in terms at least at my level that has come up to me that uh, uh, of concern about a specific uh, nursing home. Okay, thank you both. And just one point of clarity from the governor's legal counsel. Existing law provides immunity. The executive order just clarified that that existing law applies to health care services, which is our interpretation of the existing law. Malia, Burlington Free Press. Hi, my question is for Secretary Smith. We had a reader who said that when she tried to sign up for the vaccine online, 
she's lived in Vermont for many years, but she was rejected because her cell phone number has an out-of-state area code. And she was able to get her appointment when she called the number online. But I was wondering, is this something that other people in the state are having problems with? Are people able to sign up online for the vaccine if they have an out-of-state code? Or do they have to go through the number? And, and how is the state sort of addressing this? I, I don't. This is the first I've heard, um, and I'll let Secretary Smith comment as well, but first I've heard of any um, situation where the telephone number uh, disqualified anyone from signing up. And I would imagine that we had a number of people who have uh, area codes outside the state. So um, hopefully this is just a one-off uh, type of situation, but I have not uh, heard of any others at this point. Secretary Smith. Okay. Thank, thanks for the question. And, and I, I, like the governor, have not heard of any sort of situation where a phone number that does not have the proper area code is rejected. But let me look into it. Um, you know, I, I get a report on different things every night. This is one that I've, I haven't heard of as, uh, as an issue. And if, if it is an issue, we'll correct it. But I, I, I think I would have heard it if it was widespread uh, issue by now. Great, okay, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, for, I have a question for Dr. Levine about parades and events and that sort of thing, but just to clarify with Michael Harrington, if you received one of these 1099Gs, whether it looks correct or not, you want them returned and preferably unopened. Is that correct, Michael? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Uh, that is correct. We would like to have, just to minimize confusion across the board, we are asking that all 1099 G's that have been mailed and received get returned to the department. The department will mail instructions and a self-addressed stamped envelope to individuals who receive these 1099s so that they can return them. Uh, we will also have other methods for returning if, if that becomes an issue. Um, I think the, you know, what I don't want people to do is inadvertently um, not open uh, a piece of mail from the department that could potentially be a, a benefit check in some way. Um, but, uh, and so that's where uh, it's likely if the, if the name and the address match and you open uh, the mail, um, but find out that the information on the 1099 is incorrect, we would ask that you keep that in a safe place and then return it to the department um, using the method uh, we've implemented. Um, but again, if, if you get a piece of mail where it's clear that the name uh, is incorrect on, on the envelope or on the front uh, and, the ad, and it doesn't match the address, um, that's a clear indication that, um, you know, this is one of the, the 1099s that was, um, was part of the, the mix-up. But, but even if it's, if it's correct, do you want it returned also? Yeah. Yeah. So all, e even if they open it and they find that it is correct, because we do know that there were others that were sent out that were correct and had valid information on them. But again, to minimize confusion, we would just prefer that all 1099s are returned and we will issue uh, new 1099s from all our programs. Um, and that way there's, there's no uh, mixing up at, at the individual level of which ones are good and, and which ones aren't. Um, so if we have them return all of the ones they have received to date uh, and know that the department will reissue uh, new 1099s later this month. Okay, great. Thank you. For Dr. Levine, I'm getting this like third or fourth hand, who knows what, but um, an event organizer said that you told them that there's a, between a zero and one percent chance that events and parades will be able to come off in their usual forms. And if, whether that's correct or not, what, what's your expectation as we go forward in the summer and fall for events and parades and that sort of thing? Boy, I really didn't give them much of a chance, zero to one percent. I don't recall ever well, saying. Well, yeah, there's something there. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't recall uh, the question or the uh, answer that I was quoted as saying, but to answer your question specifically, um, I, I want people to really look with optimism towards the spring and summer. Uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't look with optimism. 
and we're going to have more and more people vaccinated during those time periods. We're going to have still, at least in the spring, uh, continued adherence to uh, masking and distancing. Um, but that doesn't mean we, we can't start to do some of the events. And you mentioned parades. Was that the other thing? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count them out. It's just a matter of how early would, would we get there. And, and that's, yeah. you know, it's a little bit of a, uh, a race, if you will, because of the fact that we have to have more enough vaccine coming in and these indications of some bright lights in that tunnel is really good. So further expanding them, adding in the Johnson & Johnson if it does achieve uh, emergency use authorization, adding in perhaps another one if that competes well and does the same. Um, so I, I don't think we should discount that at all. Um, I'm trying to think of a parade that would come up in the near future, I guess, certainly, there won't, there won't be St. Patrick's Day, okay? But there will be <laughs> Memorial Day. Um, okay. I, I'm not saying that we can have parades Memorial Day, but I'm saying that'll be a time that'll be pretty interesting because it's late May. We'll have a good idea of uh, what percentage of Vermonters have received vaccine. We'll have a good idea about how the warmer weather has uh, changed our case mix and our uh, numbers in the state. And... Uh, We'll, we'll see where we are at that time. I wouldn't want to discount anything like that. It might be a little early, but again, it might be just right. A lot of factors to put in the uh, equation. Uh, great, thanks. You know how rumors are. All right, thank you very much. Pat, WCAX. Hi, this question is also for Dr. Levine, but it's about Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. Some people have told me that they don't want a vaccine that doesn't have the same level of efficacy as the Pfizer or Moderna shot. Will people have the option down the line to choose which vaccine they receive? And then what would you say to the people who are looking at that efficacy number and then see it as less desirable? Yeah, I think, thank you. I, I do think it's human nature that all of us would look at that number and go, I want the better one. Uh, and that's the sort of reality of how that looks. Uh, when you only evaluate that one number, and that number was, the key to the end point of the study, which was moderate or severe COVID. Um, the real thing that the vaccines uh, should be really held in high esteem for is their ability to prevent people from getting really sick. So severe end of the illness spectrum, and then hospitalizations and deaths. And the fact that this vaccine performed so well in those categories is really what people should take home as a major take home message. Then if they want to add into the equation, if they need more to make it seem more attractive to them, they should add into the equation the fact that nobody had anaphylaxis. They should add into the equation they do not have a high percentage of serious adverse effects. They should add into the equation that um, across at least preliminary data that we have, across various demographic groups, whether they be racially defined, uh, age defined, or um, illness defined, the vaccine seemed to stand up. The other factor that people will start to want to weigh is of course how these vaccines do against the variants. And that's gonna be challenging because that work is really happening real time right now. And uh, even at a time when most of these variants aren't at a high percentage of our cases in the country, never mind the state of Vermont. Um, and we're going to hear that certain ones do better, certain ones do worse. But as Dr. Fauci has said, um, the formulas uh, for the mRNA specifically uh, and what goes into that, what, what, what it's helping our body react against uh, can be tweaked. So with further experience, uh, a vaccine can look a little different than it did when it first came out because it's been modified to um, be effective against a broader category of, of virus variants. So all of those things are gonna be part of people's decision making, but I wouldn't want people to uh, look at the 72% and say, forget it, uh, that's really not what we want. 
because any of these vaccines uh, will do a great job at preventing us from the most serious outcomes. And in concert, all of the vaccines will do a great job at getting us to that level of community immunity and that level of enough people not able to contract a serious case of the virus that life will be uh, much better uh, in that future. So, so that's how I'd like people to look at it. Did I answer both of your questions? I'm not sure I answered the first part. Uh, just Claire, coming back to the first part of my question, so people will or won't have the option to choose which vaccine they receive? Yeah, right now, I don't see that as being part of the uh, formula. Um, I'd love to have a, a day that comes about where, where that would happen. But if that would happen, I wouldn't want people to just on their own seize on a number or seize on a specific attribute of the vaccine. Uh, I'd really want them to do that with really strong public health guidance. And that guidance, you know, could come from me, but I mean, it would come, I would hope, on a more national stage, even an international stage for that matter, so that if there were really compelling differences that would warrant allowing personal choice, uh, that we would make those factors very clear for everyone. And then the last follow-up question I had on this line was, uh, should the state consider prioritizing the higher efficacy vaccines down the line for higher risk groups? So like someone like me who's, you know, young, healthy, no conditions, would be maybe a better candidate for something like the Johnson & Johnson shot versus someone who might have a more serious outcome if they were to contract the virus or if they were to have a vaccine not work as well on them. Interesting question, and my answer tongue in cheek would be we should be so lucky that we would be able to do that because we, you know, it, it'd be like going to the supermarket and having three different kinds of cookies that you could buy and they're all available and we could just choose from them. Uh, so probably an unlikely scenario to occur, um, but I don't think uh, that will happen, at least with these three vaccines mainly because um, of the attributes that make one stand apart from another versus one look more like the other. I don't think there's anything super compelling right now in, in any of them that would predetermine one should be used for the most vulnerable and the other should be used for someone less vulnerable. Thank you. As well, I think it's important for everyone to understand these are still in the trial. Uh, on a trial basis, and um, and they still have to be approved by the FDA and CDC. I'm sure we'll get more information. We're not the only ones, you know, thinking about this uh, right now. Others are as well. Some of the health experts from around the the world will be looking at this, and they may have guidance for us. And and I've even heard, um, I think it was Dr. Fauci had said there may even be a booster uh, beyond uh, the the first dose of the Johnson & Johnson that would bring it up to that same level. So uh, time will tell. Uh, there's uh, still a lot of information that we're, we're all eagerly waiting for. All right, we are closing in on quarter of one, and we still have 10 left in the queue, so I'm just asking folks to get right to their questions and, and try to limit those. Greg, the county courier. Thank you, Rebecca. I'll try to make this quick. Good afternoon, Governor and staff. Um, I'm wondering about the likelihood of having any sort of indoor winter sports season this year. Uh, Governor, are you committed to, to making sure that indoor sports will happen in one form or another? You know, we're still, again, collecting that data that we talk about and seeing what's happening on the ground. Um, we know uh, that we're going to have to make that determination uh, soon uh, because they need to put that into place. But um, I, I envision that there will be some sort of winter sports program, um, but it all depends on you know, us getting together and, and agreeing uh, to this or not um, because the safety of Vermonters comes first and we want to make sure that the, uh, we do it for the right reasons. Uh, it's hard. Uh, we, you know, we need to use our, our minds and not our hearts in this situation. And it's, uh, it's difficult because I know kids need to get back to that. There's a, an emotional uh, component of this that we have to recognize and what, what is best uh, for all involved. So, again, I, I know I, I'm, um, we're, we're having these discussions almost on a daily basis, and, uh, and we have to make that decision fairly soon uh, so that the uh, um, 
the Prince, Principals Association can move forward with, with something or not. So um, stay tuned. We'll probably have more information on this on, on Friday when we give our educational update. Uh, since, since Tim kind of opened up the can of worms on having a percentage, can you give us uh, like the, the percentage, the likelihood that it would be canceled or the likelihood percentage-wise that it, it would go on in one form or another? Yeah, somewhere between zero and 100. Oh, thanks. Thank uh, you, Governor. Governor, this is, sec oh, this is Secretary Moore. I just want to flag for people um, that we have created a, an approach, a path forward for both uh, small size competitions for outdoor sports as well as virtual competitions for indoor sports. We recognize this doesn't get at team-based sports like basketball and hockey, um, and, but are, are working very hard to, to create opportunities. They may be non-traditional opportunities, but are opportunities all the same for as many athletes as soon as possible. Thank you, Governor, and uh, glad to see you got an A in uh, Politics Mathematics 101. <laughs> Twice today I've had to do math. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, good, good afternoon. Um, I guess I, I want to press uh, Dr. Levine a bit on the question that uh, Ed Barber asked earlier. I have a letter from a reader who has a, a very specific uh, situation. She has had both uh, of her COVID vaccine shots and has a loved one in a nearby nursing home. Um, she is very worried because she says her loved one is failing and she believes that part of the problem is the lack of the ability to socialize with her family. Since both the person in the nursing home and the, the writer have had um, both doses of the vaccine, um, she has asked the nursing home if she can visit, you know, once the time needed for the vaccine to take full effect uh, passes, and they don't have an answer. Um, does Dr. Levine? I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer this, but I just want to reassure everyone, uh, this is on the front burner for us. In fact, uh, one of the many meetings I had over the weekend was on this very subject. How do we get... Uh, to a point where we're uh, allowing uh, more visitation in some sort of getting back uh, to normal for those in long-term care facilities. Uh, we know this has been too long for most of them and, and the emotional drain on them is, uh, is uh, overwhelming. So we, uh, this is something we, we, we take very seriously. Um, we want to do this. We know that We've already gone through the first and second doses in many of these facilities, and what that will mean uh, for them uh, that are uh, that are in these uh, these uh, communities. So that probably is now the third time in this press conference you've heard that this is top top burner, front burner, and uh, we're working hard on it. I have to say, in defense of whatever facility this woman's relative is in. Um, they are regulated, and per their regulations, they are probably saying the appropriate thing. Uh, they need the pathway forward that we're hoping to find um, in compliance with the regulatory environment, but also uh, using common sense and understanding where we are at this point in time. I don't know where the nursing home is located, but uh, much of the regulatory environment involves what the percent positivity rates are, county to county in Vermont. So it's more complex than just her vaccination status, her loved one's vaccination status. Um, there's a whole host of other factors. So we're putting all that together. So you can reassure the reader, that if they're not listening already, um, that we regard this as uh, important as she does. And this to me is one of those things that we should be able to do early in our way out of a pandemic. Uh, if vaccination is going to provide that pathway. So that's why it is one of the first things we're looking at. Um, thank you. 
I have one other question that came in in a similar fashion uh, from someone who is very concerned about the lack of um, places where a person in Essex County can be vaccinated. Um, right now, there are locations, I guess, uh, around the edges of the county, but um, for older people, and of course, those are the people who are eligible to be vaccinated right now, that means long trips in bad weather. And I just didn't know whether Secretary Smith knows of uh, someone galloping to the rescue. I don't know about galloping to the rescue. Horses don't really like me for some reason. Um, the one thing that I'll, I'll do um, is check on this. I know we have an FQHC up there that's um, um, that's poised for uh, vaccination. I know we have hospitals on either end, uh, St. Johnsbury of Essex County. Um, uh, we got St. Johnsbury and we got Newport up in that area as well. Um, but let me just double check, Joe, before I um, say something that may be incorrect. Thank you very much. I, I would also add, um, pay attention uh, to this, uh, what I had announced earlier that the uh, administration had told us during this meeting that they were going to implement this next phase, a pilot in some respects with the, uh, with the pharmacies. So there's going to be uh, another 10%, another thousand doses coming into the state, going into uh, through the, the pharmacies directly, I believe, from them. We'll get more details on that, but that could help out as well. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, good afternoon. Um, I will stay on that very topic. Thank you, Joe, for opening it. Um, it's the uh, primary question I wanted to ask, um, Essex County has uh, less than half uh, the vaccination rate as the statewide average right now. And, um, according to the um, clinic plan that I've seen from the, uh, the federally qualified health center, there's only 200 doses allocated to the county in the next two weeks, um, which would still leave Essex County uh, well below the statewide average as it is today, much less uh, where it will be at the end of those two weeks. So um, I don't know whether there's galloping involved, but um, uh, Secretary Smith, you mentioned um, uh, additional allocations and clinics in your conversation with Mike. How much of, of that type of planning is still going on? I, I also, and Secretary Smith will answer this as well, but I just want to uh, caution everyone uh, when you're looking at the data, uh, some of this was front loaded. A lot of the, the long-term care facilities were located in other regions with a higher population. So some of them were accounted for in the early beginning. So it may be skewed just a bit when you're looking, comparing one county to another uh, based on uh, some of the some some of the density uh, and I not just population but density of the long-term care facilities and how that's skewed it just a bit secretary smith yes uh, thank you for the question and and the governor's right if we get more dosage obviously um it helps everybody not only uh, essex county but orleans and everybody else in in that area what we did is tr uh, tried to be fair about this and look at the number of 75 plus year olds that there are in every county and proportionately um, use the, uh, uh, you know, a proportionate amount for the vaccine going to how much your 75 year olds are a portion uh, statewide. So we really tried to do this sort of on a per capita basis and look at a fair way of doing this um, so that we could be um, equitable throughout the state. I think the governor is right. Um, w if we get more vaccine, you'll see those numbers go uh, up. And secondly, um, the long-term care facilities probably do sk skew those numbers a little bit as well. So, but let me look into it and um, um, go down that road uh, as well. I can't put a uh, vaccination site into every town but what we're trying to do is something similar to testing is that um, 
bring the drive time down to 30 minutes um, as, as much as possible. Now, uh, obviously, a vaccine uh, supply is, is, a big, um, is a big thing in doing that. Um, and the ability to um, store and, and administer those vaccines in a way that's safe um, but let's look into that uh, and uh, move forward in your area as well. And uh, while you're at the podium, Secretary Smith, um, the, the 110,000, nearly 110,000 doses that we've received thus far with 74,000 administered, uh, are those uh, an account, uh, the 110,000, are those all um, first doses or is that, um, is that differential of, 35,000 second doses that are already spoken for and being held for the appropriate time. Yeah, the 109, I think it's 109, 110. I think you're right on on the number of doses, and I'm coming right from the straight uh, top of my head, Is bo are both doses. You have uh, both uh, first and second doses in there. On the 70,000 doses, um, the math works, uh, but it, it splits down to... 35,000 first doses and 19,500 second doses. Remember, the second doses are are, are two doses there. So, uh, so the 35,000 or so that have not yet been administered, a good chunk of those would be second doses that are being held for, um, for yeah. the appropriate yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, there'll be there'll be okay. second doses in that that amount. And uh, do you have any clarity yet on when you'll be opening up registrations for the next group if you're already 34,000 registered for 75 and above? We're having those discussions right now. I would say stay tuned in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. All right, we have seven left in the queue at 12.56. Avery, WCAS. Hi, my first question is um, just a quick clarification about registering. So if someone is trying to register with their spouse, do they, they can use one email. They just need to do the registration twice or how, how does that process work? We had a question from a viewer. Secretary Smith. Avery, there's two ways of doing this. Um, each person has to register, but there's two ways of registering. First, you can register with your separate emails. Um, that's one way. Um, or you can call and have the person at the uh, call center uh, take your information and do two separate uh, uh, applications in, in terms of registration. The other way is there's a dependent button up on the registration site, and you can click the de uh, dependent button, and that will that will ha that will kill you. Uh, cue you to put in information of a of a spouse, for example, um, but it will probably ask for, you know, it will it will ask for information again uh, on that particular spouse because they have to register with that. This viewer did say they they put the dependent in, but when they went to call to follow up to call about the appointments, they were told they only had one um, one person registered. Do you know why that would possibly happen? No, I don't. I, I, you know, I haven't heard of that instance. We've had 34,000 people register, and I haven't heard of that. I've heard of people saying they had to do another email address in order for that to work. But um, it, if we can go offline, and if if I can be assistance to that person, let me know. Okay, I think they were able to get an appointment, but we just wanted to make sure for future. Uh, we figure we might get future questions. Um, and my follow-up is also for, for you about your comments about the NEA meeting. Are you getting different groups approaching you to lobby for priority in the vaccine lineup after we get through the folks with chronic conditions? And how will you keep that process transparent? I've got everybody lobbying me on uh, different priorities. And I'm willing to hear everybody, but we're, we're committed to preventing death. And we're committed to this strategy of making sure that we get through the age bands, as the governor mentioned, get through those 65 to 16 uh, with underlying conditions, and then we will develop a strategy of where to go from there. But um, we're committed to the strategy we got now. 
but we will listen uh, to anybody that wants to come and talk. Uh, Governor, the National Federation of Independent Businesses represents a thousand Vermont small businesses. They want you to stop increases in unemployment taxes, saying that they were responsible for the forced layoffs. They also want you to limit their legal liability from legal challenges related to COVID-19, assuming they followed all the state safety requirements. Uh, can you, will you do these things? Well, I think I've committed to the no increases in unemployment um, assessment uh, in the near term. I, I think I said that during my my state of the state or the budget uh, address, one of the two. Um, so I'm I'm committed to trying to follow through on that. Uh, I believe um, we'll have to get agreement with the with the legislature on that. But but the unemployment trust fund is in pretty good shape. I mean we're down about half or a little bit less than half at this point in time, uh, which is pretty significant. Uh, we've already been a year, and I would anticipate that the uh, um, the fund uh, will will be uh, in pretty good shape as we move through the rest of this uh, pandemic. Uh, in terms of the other liability, we have not uh, um, considered that at this point in time, uh, but happy to do so. And, and I'm sure the legislature uh, will have to be engaged as well. Okay. My other question was going to be, do you plan to swim in the Lake Memphremagon winter swim? I do not plan to, no. Okay, all right, thank you. Eric Kondargis? Yes, this is for Secretary Smith. Uh, when talking about cancellations due to snowstorms, uh, you said there was 21. Does that mean that there's 21 wasted doses? What happens to those doses in a situation like this where people can't physically make it to their appointments? Yeah, again, um, unless Secretary Smith's going to answer something different, those those doses aren't wasted. Uh, we anticipated this, and uh, we, we will not waste any doses as a result of any cancellations due to the storm today. Okay, thank you. An older Vermonter who has a number of underlying conditions, so she feels like she's at very high risk of getting the virus or having complications, but it also had um, a reaction to penicillin a long time ago and was denied uh, the vaccine because of the potential for an allergic reaction. I was hoping maybe Dr. Levine uh, probably would comment on, you know, at what point does the... Um, you know, the risk of getting the virus kind of outweigh the risk of having an allergic reaction. And, you know, where is the state's, what is the state's concern about, I don't know, liability in those kind of cases? Sure. So um, always challenging to play doctor with a patient you've not met and don't have all the information on. But I'll do my best to answer your question. First of all, I would want to know uh, who told the patient they could not get the vaccine, if it was their own physician, if there was a specialist in the allergy field, if it was the state of Vermont uh, at the registration site or at the time she actually came in to get the vaccine. Because we do have questions about allergy and anaphylaxis. They pertain to the actual COVID vaccine or the ingredients of the COVID vaccine and they do not pertain to a prior antibiotic allergy like a penicillin allergy. There are times that someone's own physician might be nervous about it in the context of the person's whole medical history and would want to have an allergist uh, consultation to make sure that this was indeed a safe pathway. So we are not in the process of denying people whose only allergic history is an antibiotic uh, allergy from getting the vaccine, though certainly we would welcome them uh, being nervous themselves and wanting to explore their allergy further um, prior to getting to the site 
uh, to get their vaccine administered. So um, okay. I, I don't want to oversimplify or overcomplicate, but the reality is there are some clear contraindications, and that is having had the first dose of COVID and having anaphylaxis or having anaphylaxis history to a component of the COVID vaccines, which we've uh, made the ingredients uh, known to people. Then there are um, not contraindications, but things that should be considerations, which would include other allergies. But the majority of those other allergies don't actually prevent a person from getting COVID, though they might warrant them getting their uh, COVID vaccine in a very um, supervised setting, which of course we're doing anyways with the wait times, the presence of EpiPens and things of that sort. Okay, just, just to be clear, um, this woman was turned away at the vaccine clinic herself and um, she was told to visit her primary care doctor to get the vaccine. Her concern was that it appears that her primary care doctor uh, doesn't have any vaccine at the moment and you know she doesn't know when she's going to get it at this point. So, yeah. Just you ask, so if you uh, uh, get if you would get her permission if you if you get her permission uh, and then have her send the material this whole issue to me we can look further into that specific case because it does seem a little uh, against our common guidance at this point. Okay. Thank you. Colin, seven days. Hi, I was wondering if there was any discussion about um, potentially new restrictions on skiing in light of um, the cases that we're seeing in Bennington um, that you mentioned earlier. Again, um, we are watching the situation, obviously, with contact tracing. We are not seeing uh, elevated cases due to the skiing itself. Um, so at this point in time, we're not contemplating any further action, but, uh, but we're monitoring that on a daily basis. Okay, it sounded like there was something related to skiing. Was that case? Could you just clarify that? Because I thought earlier in the press conference there was a mention that. I'll have Dr. Levine answer. Um, okay. Yeah, the issue is it's not related to the sport of skiing or the engagement in that activity. The question is, is it related to people who are coming to those parts of Vermont who may actually have asymptomatic cases of COVID uh, and test positive? Uh, but it's not because they're skiing or because the ski resort isn't physically distancing and working their lifts out correct, et cetera. Got it. Okay. And then my other question was, um, I know there's been some discussion over the last week or two about phase 1A vaccines, and, and from the sounds of it, starting this week, hospitals will be resuming those after a week pause. I'm just curious whether the state has any estimate on how many people might be left unvaccinated in the phase 1A group at this point? Thank you. Colin, Mike Smith, I don't have an estimate of how many are not vaccinated at this point. We are allocating a portion of our, um, our weekly dosage to uh, make sure that we do get 1A. Um, I, I will, I will t take a guess, and it's an un uneducated guess. We're definitely on the downside of wrapping this up uh, in terms of where we are. We've allocated about 960 doses uh, this week uh, for 1A. Also, 1A is on the call list um, if we need to um, bring in uh, various people because we have extra doses at the end of the day. So between those two, I think we're going to be wrapping up 1A in bulk. We'll never wrap up 1A as we would never wrap up probably uh, seven, you know, uh, the various groups as, as, as uh, people, um, uh, you know, a, as there are groups. Uh, there'll be n new nurses, for example. There'll be new doctors. Um, but we'll never wrap it up. But I think we're on the downside of, uh, of big allocations going to uh, 1A after, uh, after a few weeks here. Okay, and then just one last follow-up. I understand the hospitals made some requests um, late last week as far as how many phase 1A doses they would want for this week. 
just curious as to was there any criteria given to the hospitals on what to base those requests on? Like, I, I understand there was about 2,800 or so doses requested throughout the state, but I um, am I under the impression that there are far more phase 1A people than that who are, remain unvaccinated. Do you have any idea where what those figures are coming from? Were they told to request doses based on a specific thing like perhaps the number of people they've had requested or anything along those lines? Yeah, I haven't heard those numbers at all that you just mentioned, but let me let me get back to you, Colin, because that's... Um, uh, we usually have those conversations with the hospitals, and in those conversations, we decide how many vaccines they have on hand, how many they may need in accordance to uh, lists that are still available out there in terms of 1A. Uh, but those numbers that you just quoted just don't jive with anything that I've heard. So let me look into it and let me get back to you. Great, thanks. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, one for the governor and one for the doctor, if I may. Um, the governor, you'd mentioned set-asides for the BIPOC community, and um, I would wondered uh, about indigenous peoples, uh, uh, what would no tribal, federal tribal recognition and, uh, you know, reservations or anything like that. Uh, how would one qualify as uh, indigenous? Um, do you use the Elizabeth Warren standard with high cheekbones, or uh, do you just take people's word for it? Um, I'm going to refer to Dr. Levine. I'm sorry to do this to you, Dr. Levine, but. So. We have a number of uh, advocacy groups in the state that very well represent what we go under the rubric of indigenous, and we work with those groups as part of our health equity work all the time. So those populations are actually well represented to us, and we hope uh, equally that we're as responsive as we need to be uh, to them. So it has nothing to so, do with federal, yeah, hope, federal recognition. It has to do with more practical and pragmatic um, concerns. So it's a statewide thing. Great. Yes. Um, it, uh, doctor, at the last uh, at the at the last conference, you had mentioned the uh, the WHO uh, task force or whatever um, finally being allowed into China uh, over a year later. And um, one of the people on this task force um, is a guy named Peter Taz Dazak, D A S Z A K. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. He'd ran a Eco Health Alliance uh, and actually channeled money to the scientists in Wuhan. And um, there's a professor, um, uh, Richard E. Bright. Uh, he's a professor at Rutgers and a biosecurity expert. Uh, he said that uh, Dr. Uh, Daszak was a contractor responsible for funding uh, high-risk gain-of-function on SARS-related bat coronaviruses at Wuhan and a collaborator on this research. And uh, he, he has spent the last year publicly defending um, this scientist known as the Bat Woman in China. Um, with this kind of... Uh, uh, with this kind of conflict of interest and his cozying up to the to the Chinese government and and the conflicts with with his company also um, how can we you know uh, how could how could something like this happen uh, shouldn't there be neutral parties at the WHO <clears throat> yeah you've certainly done a lot of research on that issue uh, so I'm going to make the assumption that your research has borne fruit and this is truly what the case is. And my response would be that it's not a one-person operation, that the oh, WHO, the team, yeah. 
Pardon me? It's that, a team. Yes, sure. right. The WHO has sent an entire team there, of which I know there's at least five or six, if not more people. I don't have the number. Um, so I would hope that, like anything, they do an independent assessment and they come up with the conclusions they come up with. And if there's a um, outlier and it's this person, um, you know, their views can be represented in their report. They should show what the consensus report was of the team. So I'm hoping uh, your concern won't uh, lead to any, um, you know, lack of transparency about what they actually did find. It's about all I can say. Well, what would, I mean, would this, do you support this gain of function research? I mean, uh, at, at one time, at one time we used to have uh, above ground nuclear. Bit. So, I believe Dr. Levine has answered this question quite a bit and we're running pretty late today. We have one more caller. Okay then. Well, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Devin, Local 22. Hi, are you able to hear me? We can. Apologies for being muted earlier. I promise I'm not just trying to go last every time. Um, my question is for Dr. Levine and uh, Governor Scott. Maybe this is uh, something that came up in your call with the Biden administration. Um, so the administration made a deal with an Australian company for uh, what's eventually going to be millions of at-home COVID tests. Um, they would be $30, which can obviously add up if you're testing an entire family and it's unclear when they'll start to be commercially available. Um, my question is, at this point in the pandemic, when there's still the long vaccination process ahead of us, do you think this step is a sign that the availability and affordability of these at-home tests is going to improve enough in time for that to become a preferred and realistic option to in-person testing and be a valuable tool going forward? Um, I can uh, first comment on the uh, the call with the National Governors Association, the administration. This did not come up on that call uh, specifically. It could in the future. Obviously, testing is still part of our mitigation plan as we move forward. Um, so I'm encouraged when I see uh, these types of developments, when you have self-administered tests that are maybe 95% effective from what I saw. Um, but the price tag uh, is uh, is problematic for, for many. But but, you know, in the future, I think uh, this might be part of uh, how we uh, get back to, uh, to normal, um, where we are able to have these tests and, uh, and maybe at a, a much reduced cost uh, as uh, competition takes over and, and there's more on the, on the horizon and more available. Dr. Levine. I get to have my phone call at 6 o'clock tonight with... Uh, I don't know what they're calling themselves now, but the equivalent of what was called the Coronavirus Task Force in Washington. Um, and I'm sure this item will come up, so I can't really give you the complete answer now because we haven't heard from them. But I do agree with the governor. This is one of those things like vaccination that is being looked at as the pathway forward and the pathway out of where we are. Uh, if people could have access to something that was inexpensive, easy to use, reliable, and uh, could be done at home. Uh, it could certainly govern uh, their actions um, that day and in other days. So that it does seem like a great idea. And I know that there's more of these being uh, formulated every day, these at-home tests, but they haven't been very accessible and certainly not accessible if you don't have a lot of money. <clears throat> I'd like to think of them in terms of the gov government's role uh, like with the Binax Now antigen cards where they actually purchased with their purchasing power a huge number and provided them free to the states and then thereafter were able to provide a more discounted price for those who wanted more. Um, it would be nice if this could work out the same way, but uh, I'll give you more details if and when I get them. Great, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your patience today and for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Friday.